it's great to see you all. After leaving Smith, we moved to Mamio Beach on Pigeon Lake, where I ran the local pool hall for the summer. Kathy and the kids loved it as we stayed in an old log cabin right on the beach next to the main pier. Opposite us was the log dance hall where my dad, Lawrence Humpke, had played for dances back in the 1930s. Here is the pier. To the left is the log dance hall. To the right is the log cabin. We stayed in, and straight ahead is the pool hall. One of my university friends, David Moss, was getting married in Massachusetts, and I flew to Boston to attend his marriage to the daughter of an oil baron from Venezuela. It was an extravagant wedding for about 200 at their home, next to the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport. I was so far out of my comfort zone, hanging out with the jet set, I looked forward to boarding the plane, heading back to Edmonton and Mamio Beach. By September, we moved to the Bonnie Doon community in Edmonton. Nadine would start grade one. Roxanne was in two. And I worked on getting a license to sell real estate while finishing my thesis for a master's degree in education. Our family became active in the local United Church and I became president of the Bonnie Doon Community League. The community goal that year was to plan and raise money to build a community center. Working for Nick Storyshenko of Holiday Real Estate was exciting, and I managed to sell some houses. Al Corette was now running a hotel in Hay River, Northwest Territories and was back in Edmonton often. He knew Nick, who was just as big as Al and a heavy drinker. The three of us were so well known and drank so much at the Greenbrier Lounge, they allowed us to bring a bottle with us to keep our bill from going too high. Al, Nick, and I always dressed in suits and ties, and customers often mistook Al and Nick for off-duty police detectives. They tipped heavily and helped the staff deal with unruly customers. In March of 1972, Louis, my brother, and I drove to Hay River to see the hotel Al was running. It turned into a big drinking party, and Louis spent the night in jail while I took mescaline for the first and last time. I was so out of it, I would have ended it all and jumped out of a window, but the hotel was only one story high. I stayed in the room for two days having a horrible drug trip before I could function again. When we sobered up, Louie and I got out of Hay River as fast as we could. It seems that when one is in a downward spiral, it continues until they hit the bottom of the barrel. I had not yet hit bottom. I was busy, but still found time to frequent Ernie's steak pit and lounge in the Body Dune shopping center, where I became infatuated with Sharon, a cocktail waitress. I am ashamed 
and regret how I treated Kathy and our three daughters in the spring of 1972. It was a mistake for me to go into sales and start acting like a rebellious teenager. But I did. Being a school principal had helped me live up to community expectations. But when I became a salesman, I started drinking too much hard liquor. I lost my bearing, fell in love, and deserted our family for four months. Back in April, I got a call from Al that he was leaving Hay River and coming to Edmonton with his family. When he arrived, he told me one of his bar waitresses was in love with him. She had bought a new car, gotten her driver's license, and followed Al and his family down to Edmonton. Al was leaving his wife and asked me to come with him and the girl to Vancouver. I was so stupid, I phoned Sharon, who was now living in Calgary with her husband, a Greek butcher. She said, sure, and without thinking, I left the car at work and just ran away with Al and his girlfriend. Vancouver turned on into a month-long drinking party. Al spent most of his money and decided to fly back to his wife in Edmonton, leaving Sharon and me with his, by now, berserk girlfriend who had never been outside of Hay River. We had our hands full, trying to keep her from jumping off our balcony. And at last, I drove her out of Vancouver and headed her west while I caught a bus back to Vancouver. I told her to follow the road back to Edmonton and everything would be okay. Later on, I found out I had pointed her south, not east, and for years I wondered what happened to her. Meanwhile, Sharon and I hitchhiked back to Calgary, where we stayed with a friend who let us use his Norton motorcycle. We ended up with a group of bikers staying in a band campground and harassed by police and park officials. Sharon and I eventually hitchhiked to Winnipeg where she got a job in a lounge and me in a grimy strip club. It was about that time in June that I hit the bottom. I worked to the wee hours each night and still could not sleep. Drinking more didn't help. I just kept thinking. I had deserted my wife and three daughters and would never see them again. I still can't remember how I did it, but I got back to Edmonton with Sharon and told her I had to try to go back to the family or go crazy. Returning to Camrose and going back to Kathy and the girls, plus begging for forgiveness from both her parents and mine was the most degrading and painful thing I have ever done to myself. It was two years before my mother forgave me. Sharon's husband had come to the farm 
with the intent to do me in. And Mum had given him some recent pictures so he would know when he got me. I believed he trailed us to Vancouver, but must have given up and gone back to Alberta. I let one relative hit me a few times because I deserved it and was genuinely repentant. I had learned my lesson. In late July, Kathy, myself, and our three girls drove to Disneyland in Los Angeles plus Las Vegas. It was a wonderful trip of camping on the Pacific coast through Washington, Oregon, and California. Disneyland in Los Angeles was the most fantastic place we had ever seen, and we all had a great time. Kathy had agreed to get back together only if we all flew into a northern isolated Indian reserve and not come out for 10 months. Plus, I would never try and contact Sharon again. I agreed, and after an interview with Indian Affairs in Winnipeg, I accepted the principalship of Oxford House School. In mid-August, we drove to Winnipeg, had medicals, paid to have our car put in storage for 10 months, and boarded a twin beach aircraft for the three-hour flight straight north of Winnipeg to Oxford House. There were no liquor outlets on the reserve. Next week, join the family as we spend a year in Oxford House that ended in a tragedy for the Oxford House Reserve. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.